my fellow devotees of Jesus and Mary, friends of the cross, and attendees of the Fatima Conference, in this last talk of the day, our reflection is upon knowledge of Jesus Christ. And as I was preparing for this talk, a very vague and old memory came to me about something. It was from my high school years. And, of course, being in a traditional Catholic school, it was one of the many blessings of it is that even the uh, recreational type or or different type of educational things that are used are still very much imbued with the Catholic spirit. And I remember an old video that was that we were that we were shown about this one monastery of monks high in the Alps. And it was on sixteen millimeter tape, if you can remember that. And you got these big reels and you know, sometimes the tape would break or sometimes uh, other technical problems were ha- would happen. But it was, it was quite interesting. I'm not sure if it was just a filler that we were to have or supposed to count for theology class or history class. But anyway, I do have this, these vague memories of it, and I remember it was quite interesting. And these would be the monks that uh, would go rescue people that got buried in the avalanches that would happen so often up in the Alps. And, you know, as soon as they got word that an avalanche happened nearby, they'd strap on their skis, probably get their St. Bernard dogs ready. That's, that's where they were. They were. That breed of dog was specifically bred for, you know, helping with rescues like this. And then they would ski out there, and then they would start, well, they, would, they had these very long, thin, steel, uh, flexible strips. They would start poking down many, many feet down into the, into the avalanche snow that had just fallen there. And it was the only chance that those people had to be discovered. And then monks then would dig them out before they died of asphyxiation. But there was some, I think this movie, it was, again, probably made in the 30s. I think the idea was to show the beauty of monastic life. And it just showed, of course, what the monks did when they were not praying or doing other labors, and probably were Benedictines. But this is the memory that comes to me. And I think the monks were chanting vespers and the camera focuses in on one monk. You can tell that he's been there for many years, old, grizzled, but, you know, fully given to his prayer. And using the movie techniques that um, were available even back then, there was a slow fade of this monk. It was a... It was a sh- a view right here from his, you know, mid chest on up, and it he starts to fade, and then the picture of Christ appears, our Lord, and the message is unmistakable. That monk, by living his vocation, maybe he was a priest, maybe he was only a brother. But his life was all about becoming more like Christ. Becoming an image of Christ. And what is true of that monk is actually true of us also. That is our calling. You're obviously not called to the monastic life. Most of you here called to the married life. Some to the single state. Some may be religious here, but it's, all, it's true of all of us. We are called to become images of Christ. That's what a Christian is. 
It's not just somebody who says, I believe. I take Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And then to continue living a worldly sinful life. That's the merest of lip service given. And our Lord even had a very forceful saying. Not those who say, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But those who do the will of my heavenly father in heaven. It's not enough to say, I believe. We also must do. We must become like him. Obviously, the type of sanctity for a monk is different in some ways, but essentially, it's the same for all of us. We're all called to become Christ-like. As we get older, as we go on in, in our lives, as we live our faith from year to year, there should be evidence of us becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. And that must be our daily endeavor. Every saint, he or she, whoever they were, they became more and more like Christ. They were rewarded for how closely they imitated our Lord. This is why I believe St. Francis of Assisi is one of the very highest saints in heaven because who, who lived as Christ did more closely than he did, even to the point where he had the stigmata, the wounds of our Lord for two years or so before he died. It was a living crucifix, most certainly a Christ-like, saintly person. So it's all about becoming like our Redeemer. And that's what our Blessed Mother wants of us, that we become more like her son. It is he who said, learn of me, for I am meek and humble of heart. That is only one of two, well, there's probably a couple more places, but I'm thinking at least two places in Holy Scripture where we're told to become like God. Not in his power, not in his knowledge. Remember, that's what Eve was tempted with by the serpent. You will know as God knows, so that's why he doesn't want you to eat this fruit. So we're not supposed to seek to know as God knows or to do as God does, but to be holy as God is. That's what we're called to be. And Jesus here in that, in that sentence, learn of me, copy me. And he identifies two virtues in particular, meekness and humility. Obviously, those are very important to him that he would mention them. He had also told us in the Sermon on the Mount, be perfect like the Heavenly Father is perfect. So, in a sense, we're given an impossible task. We can never reach the imitation of God, but Jesus says, keep trying. Keep trying to get as close to that as you can. If one is not doing this, he or she is not a Christian. Again, it's not enough to say, Lord, Lord, or he's my Lord and Savior. You must do the will of the Heavenly Father. And that takes a lifetime of effort to imitate the virtues of our Lord. It's a command. Be perfect. Learn of me. Do it. I remember an experience. I want to share this with you that I think will get across this idea of imitating Christ. Uh, Some 20 years ago, I was at St. Mary's Parish in Tacoma. 
and my parish or pastor's office happened to be very well it was actually in the basement of the church where the school uh, was being the school classrooms were it was a, a smaller school at the time they've expanded since so I often got to see you know what the children were doing how they would go about their classes saw their activities the parish hall there was their school lunchroom so you might say I saw them uh, close at hand quite a bit and of course by the same token they saw me also and we had a very enthusiastic art teacher who taught the children well she was one of the parishioners there and just shared her, her great love of art with the students. And she had each of them do one day, this is one of their many projects, is to do a Play-Doh sculpture of some historical figure. And some of them didn't come very close, as you can imagine, to the historical figure, but some of them were pretty good. And she came into my office one day and said, "Father, the students all would took a vote, and they would like you to do a Plato sculpture too." And I said, "Oh, all right. I'm not that good at art, so so you can you please help me? Help me with some of these techniques." And she said, "That's fine." I said, "Well, who would you like to do your uh, image of?" Well, one of my favorite saints is St. Thomas Aquinas, the prince of theologians, the, the greatest philosopher of the, of the Christian era, always liked St. Thomas. So I said, "Well, I'll, I'll do St. Thomas Aquinas." Now I have no photograph of St. Thomas to go on, <laughs> needless to say. But there is a holy card that I used. And uh, Mrs. Charlotte Karen, that's the art teacher's name, she gave me tips here and there, showed me the try, to try this, try that. You know, on occasion she might stop by when I was working on my project. And I had the, the holy card of St. Thomas Aquinas there nearby. And I found myself looking at it many times, you know, trying to get a feature of his, you know, just okay, and just look at it some more. I realized later on that this was quite, could be used as quite the illustration of what we're about. We are all called to mold the image of Christ. In our lives, and just as I found myself looking at the holy card many a time so I could imitate it better, so too, we have to often look at Jesus. Now, you saw, by the way, the holy shroud presentation yesterday evening. That is a photograph of Jesus. What a most privileged relic that is. It's of the dead Jesus. I think, though, that it was just as he's being resurrected. I, I've, I've been to other Holy Shroud presentations And the very way that our Lord's hair is hanging straight down instead of falling off to the side bespeaks him being in a more vertical position. So, uh, and of course, the, 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 uh, the flash from the resurrection, maybe it was that that imposed the image miraculously onto the holy shroud. But we're not talking about just looking at the photograph of Jesus or what we believe to be the photograph of Jesus just before or maybe at the moment that he's rising from the dead. By the way, his feet are also in the shroud, from what I understand, hanging 
down as though he were, it seems to bespeak some verticality, but I'm no expert on this. I just remember that being said. But what are we, what should we be studying? The Holy Shroud? Although that is great inspiration, and some of the saints had this devotion to the, well, many a saint had a devotion to the holy face of Jesus, whether in his death or in his life. It is the virtues of Jesus that we have to study. This is why the first chapter of the Imitation of Christ said, says, let it be our <laughs> chief, let the life of Christ be our chief study. So we need to study our Lord, study the Holy Gospels, meditate on them, because that's how we read the one we're trying to become like. You could enlarge this analogy even more. The art teacher te- helping me with this, using her expert or sharing her expertise, which I didn't have. You can almost think of that as our Blessed Mother. She knows Jesus better than anyone else. And this is why we turn to her. But she does not want to be an end in herself. That thought can't even cross our Blessed Mother's mind because of her humility, her sanctity, because of all the graces that she's been given She wants to take us to Jesus. And as St. Louis Marie de Montfort says, when we say Mary, she then says Jesus. And she says, here, let me take you by the hand to Jesus. Again, the logic of St. Louis Marie de Montfort's true devotion to Mary. It's it's unassailable. You cannot refute what St. Louis de Montfort says. Because he speaks the gospel facts to us. Who was Jesus dependent on? Whom did he obey? With whom did he live for 30 years before he embarked on his three-year public ministry? He was with Mary. Who knows Mary better than Jesus, or Jesus better than Mary does? So if you have devotion to Mary, you will have devotion to Jesus Christ. The more you honor Mary, the more you will be honoring Jesus. That is her role. She is your spiritual mother. She raises all of us throughout our lives into spiritual growth and spiritual maturity, spiritual adulthood. Nobody knows Jesus better than she. So again, the wonderful logic of total consecration to Jesus through Mary. Everyone who saved, who wishes to save his soul must have devotion to Our Lady. That's doctrine. Not everybody is inspired to take the act of total consecration to Jesus through Mary. You're not required. But the church does uphold this. By the way, this was the true devotion to Mary was the bedside reading of Pope St. Pius X. You know how it is. Many people have a a favorite book they turn to, you know, to help them, the mind relax, fall asleep. Well, his was true devotion to Mary. And he also... He said, I impart the apostolic blessing to all who read true devotion to Mary. So in his lifetime, he was giving that blessing. We need not be afraid of honoring Mary too much. I read a really great statement one day. He says, you know when, when we would have to fear that we're honoring Our Lady too much? It would be if we started honoring her more than Jesus honored her. Now then you'd have to start worrying about it. How much did Jesus honor our Blessed Mother? He made her his mother. He made her queen of heaven and earth. Can you do better than that? Can anybody do better than that? Of course not. So it's a vain fear 
too much devotion to Mary. Look, just look at how much Jesus has honored his own mother. He is pleased when we honor her. And as St. Louis says, she must shine more than ever before. The more we entrust ourselves to our Blessed Mother, the more we live by her spirit. And again, St. Louis explains how to do this. The holier we will become. We will be able to live Jesus' teachings better and better. Again, going back to what our Lord wants us to do. There's another very powerful statement that our Lord made. Well, all of his statements were powerful, but this one really is very foundational. If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, (coughs) take up his cross, and follow me. Our Lady helps us to do that. Deny ourselves. That's not easy. But Our Lady helps us to be motivated to do that. We don't deny ourselves for for denial's sake. That's pure stoicism. No, we deny ourselves as a means to an end. We deny our sinful inclinations, our selfish inclinations. We ask our Blessed Mother to help us do that. We ask our Blessed Mother to help us take up our cross. You know, what a profound prophecy that was when our Lord said that well before his passion and death. He said, you must carry your cross. That must have jangled terribly upon the hearing of everybody that was there. What do you mean? Carry your cross? They had no idea, of course, how Jesus was going to die, that he would literally carry a heavy wooden cross to Mount Calvary. All they knew about the cross is that it was the most ignominious and humiliating death for the worst of criminals. And here, this great teacher is saying, carry your cross, but after our Lord did it, There could be no question in anybody's mind as to how to carry, uh, what he meant by that. And the crosses of life are those sufferings, especially the ones that we would never choose for ourselves, but that God has allowed to come upon us. And again, read the life of St. Louis, read him on for it. He goes on and on about how valuable the cross is, even to the point of saying, it is such a cross not to have a cross. He just didn't feel God really loved him that much anymore. If he didn't have something to suffer, a cross, <laughs> a cross to carry at that time. But our Lord again saying, deny oneself, take up your cross. If you can't do it joyfully, at least try to do it patiently. Pray for a a greater appreciation for the cross. But then also he said, and follow me. Become like Christ. His virtues appear more and more in your soul. That is the gospel. That's Christianity. That's our path. There's a particular thing, well, many things help us in our Catholic faith with doing that, and I want to reflect upon (coughs) adoration of the Blessed Sacrament and why this is particularly suited for growth and knowledge of our Lord. And I don't, typically don't quote him, but he did have some very great insights, Bishop Fulton Sheen. Unfortunately, he went along with Vatican II. Even that brilliant mind was deceived by the confluence of modernists at Vatican II. But he did have some 
very wise insights, and I do believe, you know, obviously the, the, that it's not wrong to comment upon the good ones, but he made it a point to talk about how important adoration of the Blessed Sacrament is. And specifically the hour of adoration. Why take, and I would recommend to you at least on a weekly basis, if not more frequent, an hour of uninterrupted prayer before the Blessed Sacrament. And the reasons listed are very cogent ones. Number one, Jesus said to the apostles, could you not watch one hour with me? And that was one hour of the 24-hour day at that time. So there's no mistaking it. It was 60 minutes. And that's a good enough reason to strive to do the holy hour on a regular basis. Jesus asked for it. And St. Peter, St. James, and St. John, I'm sure... After that, we're embarrassed to admit that their first holy hour was done asleep. Remember Jesus came back to them? Could you not watch one hour? Take your rest, take your slumber. When Jesus, in his human nature, most could have used the comfort of his friends, his apostles, his closest friends, They failed him. That was one of more than one failure, more than a couple of failures throughout this whole passion. So we don't want to fail our Lord. So Jesus asked for that hour. But there's other reasons we can mention that help get across the point of why this is so important the observation has been made that in scripture whenever when day is used it's used referring to god but when we're talking about the force of evil then jesus uses the word hour this is the hour of darkness this is the hour of evil this is the hour Why does Jesus say that? Because God will win the day. There's no doubt about it. But he does allow evil to win the hour. So when anyone takes an hour to pray, it's actually participating in the redemption of our Lord. It's a reparation For the hour of evil. You take that hour that evil wants to have. And you change it into an hour of goodness. An hour of prayer. It is a very high form of reparation. Father Matteo in promoting devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus. So often promoted that. And he says if you can't do it in the church. He talked about doing the hour of reparation, especially on Thursday night, 11 to 12 p.m. Why? Because that's the hour, that's the evening of the agony, Holy Thursday night. You participate with Jesus in the redemptive work that he did, undoing the evil of an hour, making it an hour of blessing and grace for yourself and others. You see, you're not just doing this for yourself. You're bringing graces down upon the world around you. I agree with what Bishop Sheen says also as, a, as another reason. By the way, he said he was inspired to make the daily holy hour from a story that he had heard of a little Chinese girl who was a martyr. 
And this happened in the th- sometime in the 40s or 50s where the communists broke in to a Catholic chapel and desecrated the Blessed Sacrament. They hauled off the the religious, you know, you know, God knows what they did to the Catholics that were associated with that mission chapel, and they broke into the tabernacle and threw the sacred hosts all over the ground. And this little Chinese girl somehow was able to crawl into the church every night, and she received one of those hosts until at the end of a two or three weeks or more, they were all gone, but she got caught the last night and the Chinese communists executed her right there. She was a martyr of the Holy Eucharist. He never met her. But he said, that's the person that has inspired me the most. If she could do that. I can make this daily holy hour. That's what the... the, the the uh, intent that he had. But he said, you know, it takes an hour to get serious prayer going in our lives. I mean, prayer at any time is good. Formal prayer of five minutes is better than not praying for five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes or half an hour or whatever. But he says, there's graces that come towards the end of that hour that you can't get at the beginning. Why? Because you've been, you've been, it's kind of like, this is my analogy, it's like steeping tea. You can't just get the benefit of it just from a a quick dunk or two. It has to steep. And when you're before the Blessed Sacrament, you are soaking in, you're spiritually steeping yourself, so to speak. And I believe this is verified. I've noticed this many a time at Sunday Mass. And yes, we have Catholics that sometimes arrive a little late for Sunday Mass. There's unrest in the pews. People coming in. You can hear it. But an hour later, which is just about towards the end of Mass during Holy Communion, there's, I've noticed this time and again, a peace and a quiet that wasn't there at the beginning. The benefit of an hour. The benefit of being with our Lord. And even though the person may not be that well disposed or not, or be distracted, not really putting his, his or her whole heart into assisting at Holy Mass, still the graces are flowing. You are with Christ physically. In other words, is this not the best place for you and for me to learn how to become like Jesus Christ? Being with him, not just spiritually, but physically, in his flesh and blood reality, you have an opportunity, we all have an opportunity to learn Christ. Many graces flow. I remember when I was growing up, I was just in grade school, and we had... There was efforts made to have perpetual adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. And sometimes it happened, sometimes it didn't. And I remember our family, the Pascorius family, had the 4 to 5 p.m. holy hour assigned. And you know we would really try hard to make it often enough. Well, I shouldn't say often, but at times I was the only member of the family doing it because... The boys' school was in the basement of the church. You'll, you'll be there tomorrow. That's went to school there for four years in the basement of the church. And school got out at 3.30, and then I would just stick around the school and wait for my mother and sisters to join me, sometimes my father, if he could get off work. But sometimes I was the only one that was able to make it. And I am certain that those hours with our Lord contributed in no small part to my vocation 
and this is true of all young people, the more they can be around our Lord, the more they will become like him, the more they will want to become like him. Let us never underestimate those graces to be had in the physical presence of our Lord. Again, the This is where the act of faith has to come in because as St. Thomas says in his beautiful hymn, Adoro te devote, Godhead here in hiding, he says the senses deceive us. The senses don't see him, but faith transcends the senses and says he's really there, just as really as the person sitting next to you or kneeling next to you in church. What a gift we have of the Blessed Sacrament. So we will learn many a lesson, drink in many a grace. We will do much in the way of reparation with any and all time that we spend here in the presence of our Lord. And just think of the dependence that our Lord has. I mean, he's almighty God, and yet he obeys the priest when, when the priest says the mass. You know, if the priest says that mass, at mass at 8 o'clock in the morning, then Jesus will come down upon that altar at about 8.20, 8.25. If the priest started mass an hour later, Jesus would wait till he, you know, till that time comes in the mass. The obedience and dependence of our Lord And just waiting for us to come and visit him. You could say there's inestimable virtues that are being practiced by our Lord right now. And again, we learn those virtues when we are with him. We grow in our knowledge and understanding and imitation of them. But going back to that word dependence... Our Lord depended on Our Lady. Not that he needed to be needed to be dependent or needed to be taught anything, but he made himself depend on our Blessed Mother. It would be if if Michelangelo sat down to take art lessons from somebody. He doesn't have a thing to learn, but he can still make himself be taught. And that's our Lord. He allowed himself to be taught by Our Lady. And so he's teaching us to be dependent on her. In our spiritual life. And dependence doesn't come easy because, you know, it's the old saying, be independent, you know, do it your way. And yet, in our spiritual life, it's not all about being as independent as we can be and self-reliant. It's saying, I need to depend on my Holy Mother Mary. Oh yes, it doesn't excuse me from the work that I need to do and the initiative I need to take, but there is a real dependence there. And when we do that, when we imitate that dependence on Mary, we are imitating our Lord Jesus Christ. What an example. acknowledging that we need the grace of God, we need the help of God, we need our Blessed Mother's help. But again, this is what it's all about. (laughs) To depend, or to imitate our Lord, and he loved his mother. She, she (laughs) She cannot be a stumbling block because she always takes us to a greater love of our Lord. I was just listening to, uh, I was able to listen to some of F- Father Philip's uh, third conference that those who love God love the things of God. <coughs> and we can never even estimate the love, <coughs> excuse me, 
excuse me, that Jesus has for his mother. So if we love Jesus, we have to love his mother. And she just makes it happen to, to be a greater, <coughs> excuse me, love for our Lord. So, again, I would even say reread True Devotion to Mary. I would, it's certainly a, a wonderful book. Reread it, I would say, at least once a year because it has those spiritual lessons for us. And remember, as long as we stay with Jesus and Mary, we're on the winning side. Oh, yes, we're going to have challenges. Things are going to get very, very difficult. But we are on the winning side when we love Jesus and Mary and try to become more like them in our daily lives. We want to be with their triumph in heaven. So be encouraged. Let us encourage one another. Let us pray for each other. Let's help inspire each other. Our good example does that always. That's what a good example does. You don't have to get up on a soapbox at all. You just have to do something good. Especially the more consistently you do it, it just makes everybody else be inspired to do something like that or something or to improve in some way. So we are, we're all part of this together. We're in the army of Jesus and Mary. We're members of the mystical body of Christ. We are fellow devotees of Our Lady of Fatima. Let us persevere and remember the power of prayer to help us always to keep doing that. We're going to, at this time, do the renewal of the act of total consecration. I'm not, I kind of have my doubts that somebody was preparing uh, for this day the, and just, just completed the 33-day preparation period as St. Louis spells it out. If you have, I would ask you to, to come up to the front and we'll give you a candle to hold so, while you read your act of total consecration. But, and even if you haven't done it, you're still welcome to pray it and at least do it as a, a renewal of your devotion to Our Lady. And, um, I, and I pray that you will keep growing in that love and understanding of our Blessed Mother and be inspired at some point to take that act of total consecration. <clears throat>